Okay. Well, sir, I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Just so that we have it. Uh, and uh, tonight is, actually, this is the first of March, and we it are is. recording. Yep. And Mike and I are on here. And uh, uh, Mike, can you open us up in prayer, sir? Sure. Father, we give you thanks, Lord. You are so good to us, Father, just all the time, every day, every minute, every second, Lord. We just give you thanks. Uh, you guide and lead, and you just like the, the good shepherd that you are. And uh, when we as sheep, we get to looking around and thinking there's grass greener over here, you, you take your crook, and you just reach out and pull us back and keep us close and keep us safe. Knowing how, how ignorant we are so many times, Lord, what can we say? Thank you. Thank you for loving us so much to, to want to guide us and lead us and protect us, your children, your people. Father, I pray that your word to go out here tonight. I pray that uh, you'd use this lesson tonight to touch lives for eternity even if it's just one or even if it's just a thousand whatever lord use it i pray wes and i we just want to be vessels of honor we want you to be glorified and seen and not us and uh just be with us tonight as we as we dig into your word again bless my brother here as he teaches and uh, help me as i just listen along and share thoughts we just want your name to be honored and lifted up in jesus name amen amen yeah Awesome. Thank you, sir. You know, talking about being obedient and listening, um, you know, I, I, I wish I could say I do it 50% of the time. I, I, I bet it's not even that. I don't know. It, it's, it needs work. I can tell you that much. Mine too. Yeah, so, but I figured we better start out our evening. Um, and this, when I, when I saw this the other day on, uh, uh, I think it was Facebook or some social media I was looking at, and this popped up, and it was like, yeah, <laughs> this Waters, he was he he really captured, you know, the imagination of this young young kid. But I, I think just the human heart, and you know, God says the human heart is evil continually, and I, I think this in in a funny way, in a, a very a serious manner. Watterson really captured this, but you know we can laugh at it a little bit because it, it, we all, well, we'll go through it. Okay. So uh, little uh, Calvin here, he's got a test he's taken. And it says, explain Newton's first law of motion in your own words. And he is just, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. Oh, he's got Ooh. an idea. And he says, yak, yak, food, mog, goog, bug, bleh, bleh, whatever he says there. <laughs> and he says, I love loopholes. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that describes our nature beautifully, so, sadly beautifully. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So my question is, is how often do we do that when we're reading the Bible? Oh, man. Oh, a loophole. Uh-huh. Anyway. Right. It says what I want to hear. Exactly. Sometimes I'm gonna make yeah. it. I'm gonna. I'm gonna make it say what I want to hear. Right. And uh, yeah, that's no fun. So then mm -hmm. I came across this. This was excellent. John Knox prayed, and the results caused Queen Mary to say that she feared the prayers of John Knox more, <laughs> and she feared all the armies of Scotland. I thought, you know, that's kind of stupid. So I wow. did some checking on it, and uh, it appears to be accurate. What I found. John Wesley prayed and revile came uh, revile <laughs> revival came to England sorry uh sparing the nation that excuse me sparing the nation the horrors of the French Re revolution excuse me yeah. sparing England the horrors of the French revolution yeah Jonathan Edwards prayed and revival spread throughout the American colonies History has been changed time after time because of prayer. I tell you, history could be changed again if people went to their knees in believing prayer. 
Even when times are bleak and the world scorns God, he still works through the prayers of his people. And uh, so I, I did a little bit of, um, um, th this is getting into our Ephesians as well, but uh, we have um, some stuff coming up. And I'm, I, I guess that's in a couple of slides. And I'll explain it then. Let me just get there first. So be careful when Satan roams the earth as a roaring lion, seeking those who he can devour. And uh, Satan has convinced generation of God's people. God's grace will endure all disobedience to law for all of our prayers to be heard. And all God's instructions were nailed to the cross. And Paul preached against God's Torah. Torah. It was a yoke no one could shoulder. And all one has to do is read the last third of the Bible to understand it. Now, you know, there's, I just picked some stuff out that some mainstream uh, denominations have taught. That doesn't mean everybody looks at this, but these are lies that are out there and uh, in one form or another. And this is just kind of condensed down to gotcha. Gotcha. a few things. It's not, you know, I'm just stuff that I've read and went through. I've heard, uh, I believed. Um, you know, the biggest one is probably all of these I've believed at one time or another. And then, you know, it's just, but anyways, it's a amalgamation of things. Right. And, um, we talk about rat poison. And, you know, a lie doesn't have to be a complete lie. A lie only has to be 0.005%. And yep. the rest is good, like rat poison, 0.005% is yep. what kills a person and the rest of it's good food and uh, warfarin clarifiasone fascion and diafasion requires the rodents to consume several portions of the bait so it's not just one time it, it's uh several portions of this yeah and it causes internal bleeding and that rodent eventually bleeds out and dies now i think there's a sermon in there but someone's going to have to find it and that's not my joke. I got uh, that um, uh, Pastor Kent Hoven, uh, he or Doctor Kent Hoven. Sorry, he's a scientist, Christian scientist, right? And not Christian science, but a Christian who is a scientist. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, and uh, that was his joke anyway. So I thought I'd use it. Okay, well, that's so true, though. That's, yeah. that's so true. He just throw a little bit of lie in there, mm -hmm. get you off one degree. And if you spend 30 years off one degree, you're going to, in 30 years, you're going to be a long ways from the truth. Yep. Well, when you're out navigating on the ocean, you get off one degree and you go 60 nautical miles, you're one mile off your target. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and that's without any weather. That's just, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you're being able to travel on that heading. So, right. Hey, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So what I want people to do is rate yourself. Rusty mm. and all or clean and well kept. And uh, I think I fall more in this area. I would like to be here, but we'll talk about Paul and his knowledge of the word of God. So disobedience in prayer. Psalm 6, I got a whole bunch of verses. I won't go through them all, but a few of them. Psalm 66, 17 through 18. I cried to him with my mouth, and the high priest was on my tongue, or excuse me, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And this is out of Psalms. Micah, then they would uh, will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them that time because they have made their deeds evil. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Yeah. First uh, John three nineteen through twenty two, uh, by this uh, shall, by this we shall know that we are the true truth and reassure our heart before Him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. Beloved, our heart does not condemn us. We have confidence before God. Excuse me, if our heart does not condemn us. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And he's referring to God here. Yeah. 
Proverbs, if one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. James 4, 2 through 3, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Uh, from a, um, a um, selfish point of view here. So in our disobedience, known and unknown. And I, I threw that in there because sometimes, you know, we, we're, we're not really on top of our game. So we don't know how we're acting. And eventually right. God shows us, hey, hey, this is what's going on with you. You need to reverse course. At least that's what happens to me. You know, oh, I me too. Me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, okay. I wish I'd have known that a little bit ago. But uh, it is because I just wasn't thinking about other people. I was just thinking about myself. And I think the big thing, though, is it's not so much that we are completely 100% obedient and perfect. It's that we're 100% know which direction we're going to run. Exactly. It, you know, uh, let's, let's face it. Uh, <clears throat> a believer in Christ who's walked with the Lord for 60 years is going to, you know, that their testimony is going to be that every step of the way, God directed them and led them. And, and as time went by, he would show them things he, that God God would show that man things that he wanted to change in his life and uh, it convictions developed and uh, oh, his life changed. He gave up things of the world that he didn't know he was hanging on to and God knew. But but yet I think that God could see his heart and his heart had a desire to want to stay true to his Lord. God can lead a heart like that and will show him those things. But he won't be condemned just because God can look at his life and say, okay, I, I want to change this and this and this along the way. But that I can be patient, you know. He's a loving shepherd guiding his people all along the way. That's how it is. We don't have it all figured out, I guess, is another way to say it, you know. And we need him and we need to walk with him so that as we go, uh, he can guide us and lead us and change us and make us more like himself. You know, and I think it's a good thing that we don't know how he's going to change us. Oh, we, I do too. We can only see what's in the headlight. Yeah. Yeah. It, it would blow us away, I think. We, we, oh, it, it might, it probably would discourage us. Yeah. That, that's where I was going with it. But yeah, exactly. So, okay. We'll move on. And then, of course, Solomon seek advice from the dead. And then holiness uh, directly affects our prayers. And we have a whole slew of these that um, people can read through. He who obeys instructions guards his life, but he who is uh, contemptuous in his ways will die. Listen, my son, to your father's instructions and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Proverbs 1, 8 through 9, they will be a garland to grace your head and chain to adorn your neck. And it, there's, come on, Isaiah 1, 18 through 20. I'll read this one. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And uh, John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My children, obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. This is where obedience starts, is in the home. And again, mm -hmm. we'll get into this in Ephesians. But it teaches us the importance of obedience. And that is carried on through through the kingdom. And, you know, what, what I find so um, relevant is a child's mind in listening to mom and dad. Yes. Um, mom and dad expect children just to listen without questioning because mom and dad have the best interest of that child in mind and the children don't question. And that's why when I put at the beginning, that God actually said, and I put it in red because we, you know, that was the first thing Satan did was question God in yeah. Genesis. And we, we need to just, okay, God, you said it. Now, 
I, I'm, I'm going to point no fingers at anybody. I'll just point them at me because I have a big problem of taking God's word and saying, okay, I'm going to believe it until you show me that I shouldn't. And, uh, you know, on, on things that are, yeah, just plainly says stuff. And it's like, okay, you know, so. Yeah, let's see where we go. This is the love God to base commands, and his commands are not burdensome. So update on Paul. That's just kind of an idea. Uh, it gives us an idea of prayer and, and obedience is such an important part of it. Uh, Paul sat as a prisoner at the time he drafted the epistle of Ephesians. And we can see that in 3.1, 4.1, and 6.20. And so it was most likely uh, penned during his first imprisonment is what they believe around uh, A.D. 60 or 62. Okay. Now, a what if, and this was not, this was our pastor brought this up last Sunday, and I thought I'd throw this in here. And he said, Joseph sat in prison for false accusations of attempted sexual assault. And there's nothing new under the sun. So my thing is draw your own conclusions. Look at what's going on in the world and see if there's any connection. Yeah. Now, Talking about Paul, and you were talking about being 60 years old believer and you run to God. Paul, we're going to uh, compare him to, to the computer. You know, we have through the computer and books, we have uh, a Bible gateway, the Word software, Blue Letter Bible, and, and you know, just a variety of other uh, uh, software that we can go to and immediately be able to uh, search the scriptures and have every passage that has this word in it or that word in it. And we can go completely through the scripture and, and then we can look in the scripture for the Hebrew meaning of those words or the Greek meaning of those words. Well, the thing is, is Paul had all of the old Testament or the Tanakh memorized and there is good arguments to say that he memorized it both in Hebrew and Greek, and write, read, and speak both languages. And those that's an interesting study if somebody wants to get into it. I was under the impression that um, he only knew uh, uh, Arabic and that Hebrew was kind of a dead language. But the more folks are studying and, and the Dead Sea Scrolls are being discovered, the more they're saying that, no, it was Hebrew that he knew uh, mm. from um, the temple as being a Pharisee. And then he also knew Greek. And then the other thing is, is he wrote most of the epistles in the in our uh, Second Testament or New Testament. So, you know, he had all this stuff memorized. He could go through his head and pull this stuff out where I I have to use a computer or, or books. or And I think right. most people are that way. Yep. So, you know, that that's what we're dealing with, the guy that he knew his scriptures that well. He did. So National Day of Prayer, that's why I kind of went through all this prayer stuff. Uh, that's coming up May 2nd. And uh, we're going to do this in um, Whitehall. And here's a, a letter that was sent to the editor. Actually, I sent it to the editor here for our a town paper. And if there's anybody in the area that's, uh, listening, I wanted to go ahead and put this on. So just in case, are you concerned about our great country and its uh, preservation for our future generations? Do you recognize an enemy infiltrating our borders through lawless deeds of our government? Have questions arisen in your being about all sorts of propaganda being pushed on us and our children? Do you want joy and assurance for your neighbor and a strong country that can be a beacon of light and hope for the rest of the world while maintaining our own sovereignty? Do you understand that a sharp sword is not the first line of defense to securing the future for our children? We have been given promises in the scriptures to assure the security. As a country, we can realize change in our government, social setting, and culture. Warriors are our first line of defense, not only those who understand the use of the sword and its power, but those who also have the stomach and fortitude to set aside personal gain, be humble, and acknowledge the power of Jesus Christ at work in our country today. 
Our country is in great need of these warriors to step out physically and in faith and to be examples to the rest of our neighbors while praying and seeking forgiveness from Yahweh Elohim, our Lord God, to heal our land. You will have to endure scoffers, elitists, and a variety of other attacks. As a nation, we have many things of which to repent. Millions of deaths, lack of justice, turning away from God's word based on our own man-made traditions. We have to start with ourselves, families, churches, towns, and states, and work our way up to the country as a whole. Our nation and way of life lie in the wake of peril, but through honest, rigorous repentance, we can stave off the waves of evil. We toil in the sights of a coming shaking. What are you prepared to do? What are you prepared to endure? National Day of Prayer is scheduled for May, uh, 2nd of May, 2024, and is themed with 2 Samuel 22, 29 through 31. First, we need prayer warriors who will fast and pray to push the enemy back from our homes and the area here in the Whitehall Valley and surrounding communities while setting aside our theological differences and focusing on God's will in Jesus' work on the cross in laying down the final foundation. Secondly, we need to band together in prayer, asking for guidance while reading scriptures over our homes and other areas of responsibility. For those who are interested, we are holding a meeting on the 16th of March, 2024, at 1 p.m. at the Whitehall Pavilion, located in the park next to the fire hall. So we're going to start there, and the National Day of Prayer is the 2nd of May, but we want to, um, my goal is to be prayed up and fasted up so that when that 2nd of May comes around, we are, are um, uh, really got a prayer covering for those folks that are coming out to, to be praying mm. for our country. And uh, I really look at uh, Daniel a lot. When it and you know what is it, uh, um, Chronicles seven fourteen. Yes, uh, yeah, First Chronicles. I think it is seven fourteen. If my yeah. people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek mm -hmm. my face from their wicked ways. Yeah, yep, and from their wicked ways, and yep. So, <clears throat> yeah, it, uh, I, I appreciate your 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 emphasis. There's a lot of, as you know, there's a lot of differences of opinions as of um, how deeply to get involved uh, politically, I guess you might say. But, uh, and, and there's a variety of opinions there. I would, you know, be more of an ascriber to a conservative, more conservative one. But at the same time, um, we can still get together and pray, and 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 I, I appreciate your emphasis on that. That this this is what we need to do first. This is what God's people need to do first in our in our land. Um, and if if we've you know, judgment begins at the house of God, and uh, we we've got to well, like you just mentioned there, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll heal. Mm -hmm. So it, we, we have to let the judgment begin with, with me right here in my heart and with the church right here, whether I go to the same church as my brother down the street or not. If he's my brother in Christ and I'm his, we both fit in to all of Scripture. Yep. And it applies to both of us, all of us. And uh, so... Yeah, a amen. Uh, we need we need revival, but it's going to start with us. Thank you. Yep, that's where it starts. It's and that's with us. Yep. And 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 you know, just to uh, stack uh, more evidence on what you said, um, if we don't have God in the middle of it, if we're not praying, if we're not repenting, we're going to lose every battle that we get into. Hey, you're if, right. If we're repenting. We're humble. We're seeking God's face. You know what? We're going to win every battle that we get into. Now, what I tell people is um, we have to understand what the battle is that we're fighting. You know, and Yeah, that's God, good. Yes. God will give us the power to win those battles, whatever that might be. Yeah. You know, so amen. however that works out. But uh, Yeah, amen. Very good. Yeah. So we don't need to beat a dead horse. <laughs>
Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> so we need to be good Bereans. And yeah, I, people need to get through and just look through these passages, read the Bible, do, do your due diligence. And find out, is it revealed to a prophet? Does it change God or Jesus? And are there two or three witnesses? So we're going to bring the Second uh, Testament and First Testament together, new and old together. And God killed two priests in the Bible for using incense that was not prescribed by God for worship. Now, just because you feel like your worship is worship doesn't mean it's accepted by God as worship. That's right. Your heart doesn't define worship, and the Bible defines worship. So... With that in mind, it was like, okay, let's let's look at this. So we have Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his incense or his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, uh, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Yeah, I couldn't imagine just seeing your two sons killed. Oh, wow. He held his peace, yeah. And then, I'm, I'm, Aaron, I'm, I'm sorry, I go just, ahead. I read this just the other day. I, I'm part of my Old Testament reading right now is in Leviticus. And uh, this this was right after uh, <clears throat> they, had, uh, they had made some big sacrifices. Um. You know some of the beginning sacrifices, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a, a sense of awe, and I think there was probably a sense of awe. I wouldn't be surprised anyway over Moses, Aaron, and Nadab and Abihu, and I just cannot help but wonder if, even already from the very start, two men got puffed up, and uh, just thought they would take things into their own hands. And try to impress the people. I mean, it doesn't really clearly say that, but I, what? Why else would they do that? You know. Uh, yeah. And right off, so to, as I have to look at that and take that as a warning to say, man, Mike, guard your heart. Don't think you've got things figured out here. You know, and uh you need to stay humble before god and do things according to god's word according to how he says which yep. is in the the theme of the whole bible study in the beginning yep so and then we're going to acts this is this is one of those things too mike where where i'm you know i'm thinking about this this deal from uh that a uh, nadab and abihu that were killed consumed by fire and it was like okay well, that makes sense uh, where, where else does that have something that can and right away, you know, as I'm thinking about this, the Holy Spirit throws in Ananias and Sapphira. Exactly. Yes. Good point. And uh, I'll read through that real quick. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? And right here it tells us that he had um, said he was going to sell this and give all the proceeds. Now, if he hadn't said that, I think he would have been in the clear. But he yes. made a bargain, and he didn't keep up his end of the bargain. And while it remained unsold, it did not remain your own. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And the same thing happened to his wife as she came in. And uh, right. they both carried out. And you go back through and read these. But to put these um, in perspective, we'll get there in just a second. Um, did I? No, I didn't jump it. The arguments can be made that uh, Nadab and Abihu and, and Ananias and Sapphira were part of God's family. They were chosen ones, and they were in covenant um, because they were doing these things. And so, you know, we have to look at that. And some of the similarities they, they had, they both had an offering brought and rejected. Two believers are struck down suddenly. Mm -hmm. Two Levites are struck down suddenly. Um Ananias were family members of Sword Nadab and Abihu. The conversion was a field to money and conversion of incense to fire. Mm -hmm. 
the bodies were carried out in a shroud and in tunics. And, you know, and the one thing you've listened to Missler, and I've listened to Missler, and the one thing he said in all his Bible studies, he says nothing is put in the Bible just for convenience sake. Mm -hmm. When God wrote it, now our periods and commas and and numbers and that stuff is a different story, but right. What, what was actually written, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit was not there for just, um, just for space holding. There's yes. always a reason for it. And so these are some of the similarities. The event startles the community on both sides. And the, finally, we have fire that consumes both in, in that the Holy Spirit is represented by fire. And I kind of go through this a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and talk about the uh, tabernacle having the fire over it, you know, the tabernacle in the desert. And we become yeah. the tabernacle and we have the tongues of fire appear above uh, at Pentecost. And uh, of course, in Matthew 3.11, John says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who's coming after me is mightier than I whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So kind of a, uh, a visual here. So yep. you have the seven, seven things that match up. So last week we talked about uh, changes in sacrifice and we, uh, um, some things that are coming up in ways in which you can see this and uh, some uh, foreshadowing in the um, Old Testament. And then uh, we had uh, the covenant. Um, we had the um, tabernacle and the sacrifices, rather, in the, the tabernacle. Then we had the, um, the priests, and finally, where the uh, word of God is stored. And we go through all of that. We did that last week. And again, a rule of thumb, and this isn't always this case, but for me, I, I look at it this way. Actions convict and speech condemns. The more I can be uh, treat people with respect and dignity, the better off I am than keep my mouth shut. <laughs> yes. And uh, we go through the the um, um, sanctification and justification and how we're a light. And that's just a, just a rule of thumb. So we get up there and then we have the different types of grace. We're going to get into this uh, later on. And I've pushed it back a little bit. So, review from last week, we went through, we talked about apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, and uh, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for building up the body of Christ. We went through all of that, and we talked about, uh, I'll just read through this, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. So we get in today's, um, oh no, this is still review. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds up itself up in love. Did you have something to add, Mike? Nope. Oh, okay. Nope, we're doing just fine. Speak the truth in love and actions. And then we talked about, um, you know, the God's uh, commands. And they hang on, love your Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and love the neighbors yourself. And everything hangs on those. And we talked about that last week. So Ephesians 4.17 is this is this is this week's um, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds take every thought captive so once people put their trust in Jesus Christ and accept his gift of salvation that those folks that were of the Gentile nations are no longer Gentiles they are converts at this point. Some people call them Gentile converts, and some folks call them Gentile believers. And um, um, 
it, it, to me, Gentile believers like an oxymoron, like military intelligence, an oxymoron. Um, I'm making a joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I like the that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I had to go there. But anyways, uh, Gentiles really, if you get the, if you dig down into it, it means a non-believer. So you have a non-believer believer is what actually people are saying, and that's not what they mean. But that's what that's what they're saying right. when you look at those words. So and I, Gentile believer. So I've changed it for my own sake of uh, uh, right. Well, it, to me, I guess I've just grown up just uh, with the assumption that if and just as a you know, according to the culture, I guess I've grown up in that uh, someone says he's a believer in Jesus. He's been born again. I assume, you know, he didn't say that he was a Messianic Jew, what they call a Messianic Jew. I assume he's a Gentile like me. Yeah. And, uh, and so, but I don't think of the term. I just, you know, he's a believer. Right. He's, you know, a believer in Christ is a believer in Christ. Mm -hmm. And that actually is Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter. No Greek or Jew. That's right. You know. So, yep. And uh, anyways, that's that. It was just one of those deals. And and what it does is it changes my my for me anyways. By doing that, it changed my frame of 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 thinking. See, I used to think that everybody that came out of Egypt with the Moses was Jews, and there wasn't. There was Egyptians. There was eleven other tribes. Um, you had uh, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Ephraim, and Manasseh and Joseph. Yeah. And you can go yeah. through the whole litany of the tribes, and it just puts my brain in a different mindset when I'm starting to read these things. Because, and the reason I'm going there is zero zero five percent of stuff can change and make something a, a poison, and mm. so I. I really go back and I okay, let's let me dig into this a little deeper. Now, again, like you said, you know, God sees a person, knows where his heart's at, he's gonna guide him. You know, and when we're ready to go deeper, he'll allow us to go deeper. Yeah. And uh, you know, so it's it's just but what I'm saying is for me, anyways, I, I've I've kind of had to tweak my brain just a little bit to Okay, let me look at this a little di different. Let me let me walk around to the edge and look at it and peer in from the other side. Right. And yeah. Like, Whoa. You know. So Second Corinthians ten three through six. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war. And this is a uh, Paul as well. We're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments on every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought. That's why it's important what we're thinking, how we define yeah. things, captive to obey Christ. Being ready to punish every disobe disobedience when your obedience is complete. So what did the pagans do? And I'm just going to go into this really uh, quickly. Um this was that video I wanted to show last week. It's four minutes. I'm not going to show the whole thing uh, because it's not all that relevant. But I want to uh, um, show some of it. And I got to do this a little bit differently because, okay. And this is, uh, they talk about, Artemis of the Ephesians in what it was like in Ephesus. Now the Artemis. Can you hear that, Mike? Yeah. Okay. Statues in the Ephesian Museum are huge. But what if an ancient Ephesian family wanted one for their home? Or maybe they were on the go and needed a pocket-sized Artemis to carry around with them. Well, to meet that demand, an industry developed in the first century totally dedicated to the crafting of smaller Artemis miniatures. They were crafted by local sculptors whose living it was to make the mini idols. You know, selling Artemis dolls has always been a cash cow for ancient Ephesus. The interesting thing is, they're still selling them. No one, of course, really worships Artemis anymore, although you can find the occasional kooky website. Oh, yeah. But industries die hard, whether they're fueled by devotion or dollars. The Apostle Paul learned this the hard way when he brought the message of Christianity up the Akkadian way into the city of Ephesus in the early 50s AD, as is recorded. 
Okay, I, I just wanted to get in the fact that they're still selling those dolls, but isn't that something? Yeah. The thing that he said, though, is they don't really uh, worship Artemis today. Uh, what I would challenge people to do is go in in prayer. Don't do this unless you're in prayer. Go in and um, check out uh, worshiping Artemis, Diana, what that consists of. And we've gone through some of our teaching on that beginning of, uh, of Ephesians. And take and, and do a study on that. And if you want to do our uh, introduction to Ephesians, we'll get into it. And look at what's going on in today's world, especially here in the United States. And you'll find that we are still worshiping Artemis today. Yep. Yep. That has we don't, not, we don't even know it. Yep. And like that guy said, we don't do it today. Well, we have to go back and double check. So they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. No humility in God's word. Yahweh Elohim, just and merciful instructions. They exhibit no mercy or grace to fellow man. And, you know, that gets back to, you know what? I know all God's instructions and you're not doing them right. And guess what? You're blah 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 going to hell and and you know that's we just because we have the knowledge without mercy for our fellow man or grace you know it's it doesn't do it do us any good so there's right. a sometimes and we forget, i think we forget that we've had way more grace extended towards us towards me yeah. than god will ever ask me to grant to somebody else yeah and uh, it's good to remember Yep. And, it, you know, I, I think God made a face like mine to allow me to understand that. You know, and I told myself this every time I put my uniform on and I was shaving in the morning. That was when I saw probably the stupidest guy that I saw all day. <laughs> back in the mirror. But and I say that in, in jest to some degree, but also um, I, I think it helps to stay grounded. Yeah. You know? I don't have it all together and the people I'm working with, you know, don't expect me to have it all together, but they expect me to be gracious to them and just. Yeah. When I was a deputy. Yeah. Uh, 419, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity and cross reference in this. Um, uh, Jeremiah 8, 18 through 22 and Jeremiah 9, 1 through 11. And I'll just read uh, five verses 5 and 6 out of Jeremiah 9. Everyone deceives his neighbor and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing inequity, heaping oppression upon oppression and deceit upon deceit. They refuse to know me, declares the Lord. And we can go through and read all of this. Yeah, let's see. Do I have... Yeah, this is quite a bit. Let me just read the first couple verses, uh, this first paragraph. But if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes and if you, if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments, but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consume the eyes and make the heart ache. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. And if in spite of this you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins, and I'll break the pride of your power, and I'll make your heavens like iron, and your earth like bronze, and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its increase, and the trees... Um, of the land shall not yield their fruit. Then if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will continue striking you sevenfold for your sins, and I will let loose the wild beasts against you, which have bereaved you and your children, and destroy your livestock, and make you few in numbers, so that your roads shall be deserted. And one of the things I tell people is, in Montana anyways, 
We have wolves that have been reintroduced and grizzly bears that have been reintroduced. And we had those uh, down, uh, not completely gone, but down in number. But we're finding that the deaths from uh, animal attacks has increased of the beasts. Yeah. And if by this discipline you are not turned to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will work, excuse me, walk contrary to you. And I myself will strike you sevenfold for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall execute vengeance for the covenant. And if you gather within your cities, I will send pestilence among you and you shall be delivered in the hand of the enemy. Uh, but if in spite of this, you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me. Then I'll walk contrary to you in fury, and I will discipline you seven folds, and I will lay your cities. I just jumped down a bit. Lay yeah. your waste and your sanctuaries desolate, and I will not smell your aromas. <clears throat> and I myself will uh, devastate the land so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled in it. And I will scatter you among the nations, and I will unsheath the sword after you, and your land shall be desolation, and your cities shall be waste. And then in Romans 1, 18 through 25, I'll just read the first paragraph here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the thing, And that's why I went back to to um, Leviticus, in the things that have been made, um, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So it all starts in the brain, and it's in the mind, and it started then, it starts now, and nothing's really changed, except now it is so important that we uh, have a... Um, a clean mind claiming to be wise they became fools and exchanged right. the glory of the immortal god for images and we can go through all that uh, in romans and i have that up here but um for this reason god this is uh 26 or 32 god gave them up to dishonorable passions for the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature and to men likewise gave up and so when we see uh, gave up natural relations with women and, and uh, were consumed with passion for one another, when we see this, this is not just your run-of-the-mill sin. This is a sin right. that we have been given up to. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's an indication that God just gave us over to our debased mind. Uh, so that makes it a little bit different. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind. So it's in our it's in our in our thinking, and then come from our thinking, then it's in our actions. So in uh, Ephesians, this, go this ahead. A I'm verse in Proverbs that talks about as a man thinketh, so he is, or something like that. Yeah. Um, also, I, in one of my Bibles here, I've, I've got a little side note on that word reprobate. King James says reprobate mind, <laughs> and uh, it says it means a, a mind void of judgment. And I thought, wow, that's a good description. I mean, it yeah. just completely void of any sound judgment mm -hmm. that would come from God. You totally turned it away and had your mind turned over to this utter senseless, senselessness. Right, right. Common sense is gone. I mean, it just... Uh, yeah, and and just the embracing in your mind, like see your mind, a, a, a natural tendency to agree with God of what he says is right is right and what he says is wrong is wrong, and you don't argue with that because it's what you've been taught. That's how my mind has been shaped when I was growing up, you know, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, anyway, yeah. No, that's good. That's good. Okay, Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. And actually, I think that'll fit well within what we're going to be talking about here shortly but that is not the way you learned christ assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in jesus to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires which comes from the brain and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds mm -hmm. and to put on a new self created after the likeness of god and to righteousness and holiness and this is all inside in the eternal internal 
and it will bleed out on the outside. So become a holy temple. And Ezekiel 11, 17 through 19, therefore say, thus says the Lord, I will gather you from the, and I put this in because of Paul's extensive knowledge of scripture. He tells us that, uh, you know, all scripture, how, how's he put it, is good for learning and exhortation or how's he put that? Do you remember, Mike? Um, so all scripture is, uh, here, I got it right here, Second Timothy. Uh, profitable for teaching and and uh oh where is it come on now come on now i thought it was second timothy and that's second timothy my friend i i'm trying to think my my brain just went blank. All scripture inspired by god and um, oh, this is terrible. I'm going to cheat. Good. Second Timothy three sixteen. It looks like. Oh, it's later on down in, in chapter three. Okay, that's right. Later on down. I was looking in the first half of chapter three. <clears throat> yeah, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That goes along with the uh, earlier verses in Ephesians 4 there. Yeah. That we may be equipped and, and ready for the work of the ministry. Yep. And, you know, he since he had all this stuff memorized, you know, Paul was a walking computer, basically. Yeah. And he was able to just pull this stuff up at a moment's notice. So, But that's why I threw Ezekiel in here. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come, they will, have, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit, and I will put within them. Now, is everything detestable and abominations been removed from uh, the land of Israel yet? And the answer, I should say, think is no um so we still have a ways to go uh, has that started i believe so some people will say no nah, it isn't some people will say yes my thought is so far everything that's happened over there the number of miracles you can't deny those so, right you know it's just like yeah we, we got to look see what it is you know now we're not completely there yet but we're on our way i will give them one heart which we don't have yet and a new spirit, so we'll bring those peoples together. We'll bring the the uh, two sides of the people together, uh, the north and the south, and they'll have one heart. And I will move, remove the heart of stone, and I will give them a, a heart of flesh, or from their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in the statutes and keep my rules and obey them, that they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And we also have this in Jeremiah 31, 33. It talks about it. And then Paul uh, well, I don't know if it's Paul. Some people claim that right. Paul wrote Hebrews. I shouldn't. I shouldn't have put that in there. I guess because um, <laughs> I, I, I. My my thought is I think he did. I'm not a hundred percent there. You know, you know, maybe sixty percent. I would probably lean hit that way too. But yeah. but the fact is we don't know for sure. Mm -mm. And I reserve the right to be wrong. Mm -hmm. The only thing I'm looking at is just the way he puts things together, and it's just. And it complements his writing, so that's why I think it, but I don't know. So I shouldn't have put that in there, I guess. Um, Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And Leviticus 19.18, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. In Zechariah 8.16, these are the things that you shall do. Speak truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. And um, Ephesians 4, 26 through 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Psalms 4, uh, and I just did 4a to begin with. Be angry and do not sin. Uh, 28, Ephesians 4, 28 through 32, let the thief no longer steal, but rather 
Let him labor doing honest work with his own hands. That takes me back to the chain gangs and how a chain gang can improve a person's uh, outlook on life. They, they see that they can complete something that is good. And I, I think a lot of these guys that we have in prison have never able to complete something that was good and how it made them feel. Mm. I think most, and, and it tells us that right here, do honest work with one's own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And labor is good for people. That's an interesting study to do through the Bible about labor. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, but that it may give grace to those who hear. And getting back to labor, whenever I have a sour attitude, there's nothing that takes care of it than some good hard work that makes you sweat. Mm. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And I'm not going to read through all of this because we're right up on our hour, but where he was pulling all this stuff, one of the places was Psalm 37. And I would encourage everybody to go read Psalm 37, one through, uh, I believe it's 40. There's 40 verses there, but read all of Psalm 37 because yeah. it is such a, a wonderful, uh, for um, Paul uh, drew from it for Ephesians, I'm certain. Uh, yes. Anyways, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, oh, I don't know. Um, he's he's given his warnings, and then he's given his instruction here. And in this last half of the of the chapter reminds me a lot of Romans one, which you referenced already. And uh, <clears throat> and I I just think you know, man, we've got to. We've really got to stay close. Uh, you know, he mentioned over here as a reminder, I believe it's in chapter 2, where he says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked in the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom... Also, we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and uh, and of the mind. There, there it is again. There's that, that yeah. the mind right there. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others, you know. And, and such were some of you, he mentions there. And um, so it's just a good... It, it's a good warning to remember where we came from mm -hmm. with all humility and remember how our minds used to think and, and where our hearts really were. Um, you know, you can look at Artemis and the little idols that they built and still build today. Um, you know, we have those things in our hearts. We may not call them Artemis or Diana or whatever it might be, but they're there. Mm -hmm. You know, you read through a number of uh, the epistles, I think, of First John. I think the very last verse of First John is, little children, keep yourselves from idols. That, that, that verse just kind of gets thrown in there. Um, now and then, what guard your heart, guard your mind against idols? Um, because we're prone to that. We're wired to worship something. Mm -hmm. We're going to worship a lot of it in America anyway, is ourselves. We want to, we want to be the one sitting on the throne of our heart. We want to be in control. And, uh, and that's, that, that's the mindset that's been taught even in much of Christianity today. Uh, there's a good message out there by a man named, uh, Paris Reedhead, he preached a message uh, roughly 50 years ago, 50 or 60 years ago, 
uh, called 10 shekels and a shirt. And back then he's talking about humanism finding its way into the church and that we've still got this mindset that says the final goal is the happiness of man. And God forbid us that we would give into that. Our, our, we're not, God did not place us here so that we could be happy-go-lucky people and have a nice, easy life and then go to heaven after we die. We're here to glorify Him and to serve Him and honor Him. And uh, we give our lives to Christ because He deserves us. We owe them. We owe our lives to Him. And, and, but again, like you mentioned there, our, our, the, the mind has been so attacked in our land for the last, I'm going to say probably about a hundred years. And, uh, and we, we just would do well to always remember to uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That, that's how we get transformed. Let God have our mind. He told us one of the things we're to love him with all of is our mind, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And uh, so, amen, brother. Thank you for this you know, good encouragement. And that was the same thing Jesus said all the time is, you know, don't even think it. Not, not, not right. just do it. Don't think it. And, of course, that's the same thing Paul's saying, too, certainly. Yes. Yeah, that's right. You know, and everything's written in our mind. And <clears throat> our, it goes back to our temple. You know, don't don't sin in your temple. Don't bring yeah. strange fire in, like uh, uh, um, Nadab and Abihu. Yeah, thank you, Adab and Abihu, uh, Nadab and Abihu. Sorry. Yep. You know, and and that's where that thinking comes in. We're bringing strange fire into the into the temple. We get to thinking that. Uh... We can do things better than God can, you know, we just, and oh my Lord, help us. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, um, I've got uh, some things I'll, I'll share with you, but uh, we should probably wrap this up. You want to give us a, a, a prayer out? Sure, sure. We'll, we'll do. Father, thank you again. Uh I was feeling kind of sober and humble tonight here, Lord, kind of warned by you tonight, Father God. But that's a good thing. And, Lord, we're thankful for that, that you care enough about us to want to instruct us and guide us and warn us as we walk. Because the truth is, or we may think we're something special at times. Uh, the Father, is the reality is that without Christ, we can do nothing. Without you, Lord, to be our guide and our Savior, our our God and our our uh, our shield in front and behind. Without you, Lord, we're lost for sure. We're doomed for sure. We won't make it on our own. We can't. So we need you, and we so we thank you that you offer uh, your love, your your truth to us to guide us and lead us. Help us to be lovers of the truth, Lord. Thank you again for this evening. For this. This time, let your word go out and bring forth fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'll go ahead and stop here. <clears throat>